probably you have heard some of those responses before. Uh, the challenge for me this during this Explore God series is to say, okay, we have these seven questions and they're in order. And I can give you an update this morning. There's 902 churches now in the Chicagoland area that are going through this series. So their goal was 1,000, so they might still hit that. But my challenge for myself was to say, okay, take this question and continue to walk through the Gospel of Luke and say, does the passage of Scripture that we are handling this morning, does it address this issue? And so let me read that passage first. We're in Luke chapter 12, Luke chapter 12, starting at verse 35. I'm going to read 35 through 40. Luke chapter 12, 35 through 40. And Jesus, these are Jesus' words. He's continuing his conversation here. He says, Be ready for service and have your lamps lit. You are to be like people waiting for their master to return um, from the wedding banquet so that when he comes and knocks, they can open the door for him at once. Blessed will be those servants the master finds alert when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will get ready have them recline at the table, then come and serve them. If he comes in the middle of the night or even near dawn and finds them alert, blessed are those servants. But know this, if the homeowner had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also be ready, because the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect." Just a little bit of a backup to last week, which will give a little bit of a context. Jesus started off this chapter, he's, he's talking to a man, a man comes to him with a, a dispute, a family dispute, wants Jesus to solve it. And, and then Jesus turns his attention to the whole crowd, the, the thousands that are there, and he gives them a lesson on, on beware of greed, and especially the abundance of possessions. And then once he gets done talking to the whole big crowd, then he zeroes in on his disciples and he starts to talk to them specifically. And, and this instruction to his disciples was that there is purpose in life that we looked at last week. And the purpose that we have in life for the Christian is to seek God's kingdom. And as the Christian seeks God's kingdom, God will provide everything that he needs. So we can live in a certain way in which we can, we can help out and see God's kingdom come about and, and, and work in that kingdom even to the point of giving our possessions to the poor. Because why? Because we know that we have a God who will provide what we need, what we need to eat and what we need to wear. He will do that. So we're, our purpose is to seek his kingdom. Now, he continues on with this conversation with his disciples. And if I go back to our question, is there a God, um, we could look at it, and some of them were referred to, we could look at this question in the eyes of the cosmos, uh, the cosmological argument that's given. And that's basically that there are these uh, cosmic uh, constants like gravity. And these constants have to be dialed in just so-so, there's about a dozen of them, and that if they are not dialed in just so-so, you wouldn't even be here. That life would not be possible. And so the thought is, 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 is that just random? Or it, because it's so precise, all these constants in the cosmos, was, is someone behind that? So that's one, one way to look at it. Another one is you could look at our emotions. And that was brought up in the video too. People looking at their emotions, our, our drive for love, our drive for happiness, our drive to search and seek and find all these kind of things that doesn't really fit into the evolutionary mo model. All these things that are, are wells up within us that even science has a hard time explaining those kind of feelings and emotions that come there. Or a third one is we could look at the complexity of a single cell. And, and, and this is what's interesting is now we can do that. And with microbiology, we can look at a single cell and, and the scientists are just overwhelmed 
by the complexity of just a single cell and all the, the motors and the, uh, the systems and everything just in one little cell. And of course, this is all information that we have now that uh, Mr. Darwin didn't have when he made up his theory about evolution. Uh, these are all new things that have come in place since then because of our technology and our drive to know, to know more. And the, the more that we know, it seems, the more complex and detailed it really is. Now, we could go those routes, and, I, and as I was in, uh, in uh, prayer week this week, um, as I was praying and sitting and thinking, and I was thinking about the sermon this Sunday, this thought came upon me. But what is our greatest evidence of God? What's our greatest evidence of God? I mean, we can, we can look at the cosmos. We can, even the scripture tells us to look at nature. And we can, we, can, we can look at the complexity. And we can, you know, we can say, well, what about this and this? You know, we're just mirroring God. You know, these emotions that we have and this love that we have for one another. Well, God is love. So we're mirroring him because we're created in the image of God. But what is our greatest evidence of God? So now, let's look at the scripture again here that we have. In, uh, but I want to go to verse 40, the very last verse, and then we'll work, we'll work back to the top. So the summary of what Jesus said in verse 40 is, You also be ready, because the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. The Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. If you were going to summarize this, he's telling about a certain event at an uncertain time. Okay, that's how you could look at that. He's talking about a certain event at an uncertain time. The certain event is that the Son of Man is coming. That's the certain event that Jesus says is going to happen. The Son of Man is coming. Now, Jesus came first. He came as the babe in the manger. And when you look at that scenario, and we look at all the prophecies, and you look at everything that was written about it and spoken about it ahead of time, it, you, you, wow, wow, it all points to Jesus. That is the one who has come the first time. Now, but your Bible also contains all kinds of prophecies, all kinds of pointings toward the second coming of Christ. And if the first coming of Christ, of Christ in the manger, was that precise, wouldn't you think also the prophecies that are given about the second coming of Christ also be that precise and that foundational to what we believe? So he says a certain event is coming. The uncertain time, that's an hour you do not expect. And Jesus is so plain here. He is so direct here. Do you know the day and the hour? No. No. I mean, it's straight out of his mouth. We do not know the day and the hour. But it's interesting that this is the part that people, especially in the Christian world, tamper with the most. And they play with this, even though it is so clear in the Scripture that we do not know the day and the hour. That they will play with this, and I'm sure that you know all the stories about people saying, okay, it's going to happen on February 22nd of this year, and, 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 you know, and get ready and sell all your stuff and, and everything else. And you know that there have been, in the past, there have been people who have caught on to that and jumped right on the bandwagon, even though it's very clear that what? We do not know the day or the hour. Jesus is telling us there's a certain event that's going to happen but it's uncertain when it will be in our knowledge. Now, this, I want to show you this is a major teaching of Jesus and the Bible. And so we're going to do some, we're going to do major work here. But look at Matthew chapter 24. Matthew is going to record Jesus saying this. Matthew chapter 24, starting at verse 36 Jesus says, now concerning that day and hour, no one knows. Neither the angels of heaven nor the Son, except the Father alone. Then if we go down to verse 42. Therefore be alert, since you don't know what day the Lord is coming. But know this, if the homeowner had known the time the thief was coming, he would have stayed alert and let his, not, not let his house be broken into. This is why you are also to be ready, because the Son of Man is coming at an hour 
you do not expect. He says it actually three times in that little portion of scripture that's there. Okay, let's go to Mark. See what Mark records. Mark chapter 13, starting at verse 32. He's recording Jesus' words again. Now concerning that day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Watch, be alert, for you don't know when the time is coming. So there's Matthew recording it, Mark recording it. Now we just read Luke recording it, but let's look at another time that Luke records it in Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, starting at verse 6. Now, this is Jesus has died on the cross, buried in the grave, rose on the third day, been with his disciples. He's getting ready to ascend into heaven. And this in verse six, it says, so when they had come together, meaning the disciples, they asked him, Lord, are you restoring the kingdom of Israel at this time? Is this your second coming is basically what they were asking him. And Jesus says back to them, he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or periods that the father has set by his own authority. And then he gets them back on track. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. He says, keep your focus on the witness that you are going to do for me. Okay, that, now let's go to John's recording of this. Let's go to the book of Revelation. So Matthew recorded, Mark recorded it, Luke recorded it. Now let's look at John. Revelation chapter 3. And this is one of the letters, the letter to Sardis, chapter 3, verse 3. He says, remember then what you have received and heard, keep it and repent. If you are not alert, I will come like a thief. And you have no idea at what hour I will come upon you. But you have a few people in Sardis who have not defiled their clothes, and they walk with me in white because they are worthy. So there's Matthew saying it, Mark saying it, Luke saying it, John saying it. Um, oh, I get another one in Revelation there, 16, 15. Here's another time John records. 16, 15. Recording Jesus' words again. Look, I am coming to you, coming like a thief. So an uncertain time. Blessed is the one who's alert and remains closed so that he may not go around naked and people see his shame. Now, let's go to Paul. Let's see what Paul says about this. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Paul says about the times and the seasons, brothers and sisters, you do not need anything to be written to you. For you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. And then let's look at Peter. 2 Peter chapter 3. Starting at verse 10. It says, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. And on that day, the heavens will pass away with a loud noise. The elements will burn and be dissolved and the earth and the works on it will be dis disclosed. Uh, since all these things are to be dissolved in this way, it is clear what sort of people you should be in holy conduct and godliness as you wait for the day of God and hasten its coming. Because of that day, the heavens will be dissolved with fire and the elements will melt away with heat. But based on his promise... So there's that certainty of it that he is going to come again. We wait for new heavens and a new earth where the righteousness, where the righteousness dwells. Um, now, let me give you a few more that aren't on your sheet. Um, so you might want to jot these down if you want to. But James, see, because, okay, Matthew records it, Mark records it, Luke records it, John records it, the Apostle Paul records it, the Apostle Peter records it. Uh, now, James chapter 5, starting at verse 7. Therefore, brothers and sisters, be patient until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth and is patient until it receives the early and later rains. You also be patient. Strengthen your hearts because the Lord's coming is near. 
So James says it also. But James throws in that element that I want to show in the second set of verses here, this urgency that he's coming soon. He's coming soon. So the next one, let's go back to Peter. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7. Peter says, The end of all things is near. Therefore be alert and be sober-minded for prayer. So there again, Peter is he's saying that Christ is going to return again, and it's going to be soon. Okay, let's go back to John. 1 John, 1 John 2, 8. Uh, 2, 18, I'm sorry. 1 John 2, 18. And it says, children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, but this we know that it is the last hour. Now jump down to verse 28, and it says, So now, little children, remain in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. So there again, there's another one stating, not only stating that he's going to return, but they're looking for him to return soon. Uh, let's go to Re back to Revelation. Revelation chapter 1, the, the intro to the book. Chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, the revelation of Jesus Christ that God gave to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending the angel to his son John, who testified of the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, whatever he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear the words of the prophecy and keep what is written in it, because the time is near. Now let me give you one more. I know this is a bunch of them, but I just want you to see this is a major teaching in the Bible. This is not something that's glossed over. It's a major teaching in the Bible. So Hebrews, he, this is the last one here, Hebrews chapter 10, uh, 24 and 25. Hebrews chapter 10, 24 and 25. And let us watch out for one another to provoke love and good works, not neglecting to gather together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other and all the more as you see the day approaching. See, there's this urgency. When they're talking about this, there's, there's this urgency about that he is coming back soon. And so what's the natural question? Like, how long has it been? It's been 2,000 years. And so you would, if you're reading the Bible, if someone's reading the Bible and hearing this as soon, as soon, as soon, you would probably go that route and say, well, wait a minute, man, it's been 2,000 years. Well, I'm, I'm thankful for the Bible because it gives us clues in this. If, you, if you're still there, 2 Peter, back to 2 Peter chapter 3, there were people in that day that were asking the exact same question. But of course, they weren't asking the question in the sense of it being 2,000 years ago. They're probably asking this question like, it's okay, it's been like 30 or 40 years after Jesus has left. Why hasn't he come back? So that's, that's quite a difference between 30 or 40 years and waiting 2,000 years. So chapter 3, 2 Peter chapter 3, starting at verse 3, Above all, be aware of this, scoffers will come in the last day scoffing and following their own evil desires, saying, Where is his coming that he promised? They're asking the same question. What, well, where is he? He's not here yet. But it's kind of been a while. And then they go on to say, Ever since our ancestors fell asleep, all things continue as they have been since the beginning of creation. They say, ah, it's never going to change. It's always been this way. It's always going to be this way. So, you know, it's a, you, you know, nah, I don't think so. It's always going to be this way. That's what they're scoffing. Verse 5, they deliberately overlook this. This is what Peter says. By the word of God, the heaven came into being long ago, and the earth was brought about from water and through water. By the word of God. He says they overlooked this, that all God had to do was say, let. And it was there. That's all he had to do. He only had to speak a word, and all that we uh, see and know is here. That's all he had to do. They, they overlooked that. And then he goes in verse 6. Uh, through these, the world of the time, through these, the world of that time perished when it was flooded. So it's remind them not only of creation and how that happened, just like that, but also remind them of the flood that, boom, 
God just decided, mm, it's gone. Well, we're starting over, scratch, boop. And boom, just like that, there was the great flood and everything was destroyed except for the two by two, two animals and, and Noah and his family and everything. He goes on to say, verse seven, by the same word, the present heavens and earth are stored up for fire being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of all the ungodly. He's saying just like God was able to create the world just like that, destroy the world just like that with the flood, he's also got this world and these heavens stored up because there's going to be a day when phew, they're going to go up in fire and there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth just like that. He's reminding them that God is so much different than you. And so he goes on to say, dear friends, verse 8, don't overlook this one fact. With God, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. Now, don't, don't take that so like, oh, now we know mathematics. We'll put our mathematics in there. So God's day equals a thousand years. No, he's using it as a metaphor, as a picture for you to understand that, wait a minute. God's time and your time are not the same. They're, they're not the same. And just as a comparison, if you were going to try to compare a thousand years to us would be like a day to God. That's what he's trying to do there, just, just as a comparison. So don't take it any farther than that, other than the lesson that the way God operates is much different than the way we operate. So if we were going to go back to our argument, 2,000 years, it hasn't happened yet. Well, that's like nothing to Jesus, nothing to God, that amount of time. Verse 9, the Lord does not delay in his promise. There's the promise. The Lord does not delay in his promise. Okay, 2,000 years sounds like a delay, but it's not a delay to him. He does not delay in his promise, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. Why is there delay? If we think it's a delay, if we feel like it's a delay, why is he delaying? It's because of us. It's because he wants to bring all the sheep home. That's why it's happening. So, now, <laughs> let's try to get back to the question. Is there a God? What's our greatest evidence of God? Well, the command, I'm back on your sheet now, the command of Jesus to his disciples is to be ready. That's what he says in this passage, be ready. Now, we, we know a lot about the end of times, but not the day and the hour. We do. We do know a lot. Because we have the Word of God, we do know a lot about the end of times. There's many different theories and different uh, 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 um, charts and everything else that you can know about the end of times. But we do not know the day and the hour. So let me give you one. Like, like there's one theory where there's the rapture of the church. There's going to be a time when the, those who believe in Jesus Christ will be raptured up and, and taken to be with Christ in, in the air. And then what follows after that is the tribulation and the tribulation is a seven-year period and it's divided in half and during the seven-year period there's the rise of the antichrist and and he he leads people in the way of of evil at the end of the tribulation there is there comes the second coming of christ the hour and the day that we don't know he comes in and he and he sets up his millennial reign he sets up this reign on the earth for a thousand years and, 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 and while this is happening, uh, Satan is locked away for this thousand years of Christ's reign. And, and then at the end of the thousand years, then Satan is released from where he is locked. And there's a final battle that's done between Christ and Satan. And, and there's a final judgment that is made. And, and after the judgment is made, then there's this creation of a new heavens and a new earth where God's people reside forever. Okay, so... And like I missed a whole bunch of stuff in between there. Okay, there's a whole bunch. That, but the, the point is that, wow, there is a lot of stuff we can know about the end of times. But we do not know the day or the hour. We don't know the day or the hour. So, here's my turning point toward this question. Well, who is saying these words to us? Jesus, right? Jesus is saying this. If you've got a Bible that has it in red, it's in red, okay? Jesus is saying these words to us. Well, who is Jesus? Well, Jesus did just like that man did on the, uh, on the video. 
took out his microphone, went on the street to his disciples and said, who do people say that I am? And, and, and they said, well, John the Baptist, Elijah, or one of the prophets. That's what, that was what was going on the street in Jerusalem at the time. That's who he is. He's some holy guy, apparently a holy guy, that others respect and everything. But, but that's who the people on the street are saying when you stick the microphone into him. Who is Jesus? But then Jesus turns around, of course, and says, but who do you say that I am? And that's when you only have Peter saying you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. But I thought, who does Jesus say he is? So, more passages here. John chapter, we're going to, a bunch of them in John here. John chapter 10, 30. John chapter 10, verse 30. Who does Jesus say he is? John chapter 10, verse 30 says, I and the Father are one. That's what Jesus says. I and the Father are one. Now, you could look at that and go, yeah, yeah, we're kind of like, we're buddies. We kind of do, we think the same. You know, we're kind of one, you know, kind of thing. We're like this, you know. Is that what Jesus was saying? Well, go to verse 31. Again, the Jews picked up rocks to stone him when he said this. They picked up rocks to stone him, to kill him. So Jesus turns around and replied, I've shown you many good works from the Father. For which of these works are you stoning me? And he's kind of drawing this out. He's saying, okay, I've done a lot of good works. Are you stoning me for a good work? Which one? Which one is it? So he's, he's making them define why they've picked up the stones. Verse 33, we aren't stoning you for a good work, the Jews answered, but for blasphemy because you being a man make yourself God. That's why they were picking up the stones. They knew exactly what he was saying. He was saying he was God. And that's why they picked up the stones, to stone him. Okay, let's go to this second one, John chapter 8, 58 and 59. John chapter 8, 58 and 59. Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, before Abraham was, I am. Before Abraham of the Old Testament, some 1600 years prior to that moment in time that this was being said, he said, he said I was there before Abraham was. And then he says, I am. And that is two trigger words. Those are words that mean God. Those trigger words take you back to Moses standing in front of the burning bush. And Moses says, who do I say sent me? And, 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 G and God says, I am who I am. So when they say I am, they mean God. So Jesus is saying, before Abraham, before Abraham was there, I am. God was there, myself was there, and then verse 59, so they picked up stone to throw at him. Why? Because of that statement right there, but Jesus was hidden and went away to the temple. So Jesus says he's God. Now, let's look at some of these other ones. John chapter 1, John chapter 1, prologue, John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God, and the word was God. So we got to figure out what the word is, because this word was God. So if we go down to verse 14, the word became flesh. Well, wait a minute, who became flesh? Jesus became flesh and dwelt among us. Who, did, who, who, became, who dwelt among us? Jesus dwelt among us. So we know that the word that's being talked about here is Jesus. We observed his glory, the glory of the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So John even mentions, he makes it known to you. So who does John believe Jesus is? John believes Jesus is God. Okay, let's go to another one. John chapter 20. If, if you're not able to flip to all these, don't feel bad about that at all. But John chapter 20, Jesus is risen from the dead. He's, he's met with his disciples one time. Uh, Thomas wasn't there. Thomas comes the second time, he says he won't believe unless he can put his finger in the holes and hand in the side, and so Jesus makes himself known. He says, here, Thomas, put your fingers here, put your hand here, and, and, and believe. And what does Thomas say in verse 28? Thomas responded to him, my Lord and my God. Who does Thomas believe Jesus is? He believes he's God. Okay, let's go to Titus. Let's look at the Apostle Paul. 
What's he think about Jesus? Titus chapter 2, 11 through 14. It says, for, by the, for the grace of God has appeared. The grace of God that has appeared is Jesus. That's who he's talking about. Bringing salvation. Who brought salvation? Only Jesus. For all the people. For the people. Instructing us to deny God, godlessness and worldly lust and to live in a sensible, righteous, and godly way in the present age while we wait for the blessed hope the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He says, we're waiting for his second return. And how did he describe him? Our great God and Savior. He puts it right together, and then he names him Jesus Christ. So who does Paul think Jesus is? Paul thinks he's God. Okay, let's go to Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. The opening of that book says, Simon Peter a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ to those who have received a faith equal to ours through the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Who does Peter? Peter, our God and Savior, puts them together and then names them Jesus Christ. Who does Peter think Jesus is? He's God. And then let's, one more here, Isaiah. We've got to go the Old Testament. One verse that we've probably read a lot over, thanks, or over Christmas. For a child will be born to us. Who do we know the child born to us to be? Jesus. A son will be given to us. Who, how is Jesus described? As the son of God. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be named, and listen to the names, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. So Isaiah, as he's writing on these words, believes this one who is coming is God. So here we're back to the question. Is there a God? Is there a God? Well, let's just ask the question. Is there a Jesus? Is there a Jesus? Well, we can know that there's a Jesus historically. We can know that even outside of biblical uh, um, um, literature, uh, there are other literatures uh, that are given that speak of Jesus. And speak of this one who has come out of Nazareth that's there. So we can point to a physical Jesus in our history. But what does Jesus say about himself? He says he's God. The greatest evidence that we have of God is Jesus. That's our greatest evidence. That's the greatest thing that we can point to when someone's questioning about God is you point them to Jesus. You point them to Jesus. So back to our passage of Scripture. Just want to finish out where here. Jesus gives at the start of this four word pictures. Four word pictures about being ready. Four word pictures. The first one is in verse 35. Be ready for service. Be ready for service. Service ready. And what that actually means is they would wear these long flowing robes. And everybody did. Men and women. And, but they had a belt, especially the men had a belt around here. And so if they were ready for service, if they were ready to work, if they were ready to run, if they were ready for battle, they would take the ends of those robes and they would pull them up around and through their legs and tuck them into their belt so now they had freedom of movement to be able to run. They wouldn't trip over those long robes that are there. You know, what would you think of at, uh, at a wedding you know, how the wedding, you know, the bride has the big long train and everything else. What if, the, what if you saw a bride coming down that had it hiked up and stuck in? You know, coming down the aisle. You no, know, she meant business. Yeah, that's what you know. Ready. Well, that's one of the word pictures he gives about this certain event that Christ is going to return. You need to be ready. You need to be, you need to be ready to move. You need to be ready in active mode for him. Um, oh, rock, what do they call that when you're, when you're in baseball and, and, we, and you're on the field and the coach tells you to be, to be ball ready or something like that, isn't there? There's something like that where you're in that position, like you are ready. You are ready for that ball to come in the, your direction. Okay, service ready. The second one in that same verse is, and have your lamps lit. So lamps lit. And, you know, the lamps that they had were oil lamps and and, they, and you had to make sure they had oil in the lamps. And if the oil went dry, then the wick would get dry. And then you're really up a creek 
But, but you got to keep oil in those lamps if you're going to have that light. And of course, light in the scripture is the message of Jesus Christ. Let your light shine. You know, this little light of mine, that kind of thing. So he's saying, when it comes about that Christ is going to return again, make sure that your message is lit. This message, this gospel that you have about Jesus Christ, make sure it's lit. And there's sufficient oil there. Then it, the third one is in verse 36 through 38. I love this one. You are to be like people waiting for the master to return from the wedding banquet. So if you're master, that means you're a servant of the master. And you're waiting for him to return. And just a little bit about weddings. So their weddings aren't like our weddings. Their weddings were, you got to, it's going to happen in April. Well, when? I don't know. We'll let you know. Yeah, you know, today, what do we have? We have, we have saved the dates, go out ahead of time. You know, we have an invitation that has all the details and maps and everything else. They didn't have anything like that. They just said, when it's ready, we'll let you know. And so here goes the master off to the wedding banquet. His servants are back home to take care of everything that needs to be taken home there. He says, but be ready, waiting for him to, when's he going to return? Well, their weddings are different than our weddings because their weddings sometimes would last seven days. So you, you had no idea when, you would have no idea when the master was going to come back. So here they are, verse uh, 36, be like them waiting for the wedding, waiting for their master to return from the wedding feast so that when he comes and knocks, they can open the door at once. Remember, the door doesn't have a doorknob. It doesn't have an outside doorknob on those houses. It closed and you secured it from the inside. So even the master of the house would come up to the door. If it was at night, he would have to what? You'd have to knock on the door, say, I'm here. He says, but be a servant where, where you're waiting at the window. You're looking out. You're, you're waiting, and, and you're so ready for his return. You're so ready for his return that you see him coming. You see him coming. Here he's coming. He's coming. Get the stuff away from the door. Get the stuff away from the door. And he's just about ready to knock on the door. And whoo, you open it up. You know, whoo, oh, I'm here. Yeah, he said, that's, that's the whole picture, that you are so waiting for his return. That, that you're, you're watching for the very door. Now, the beautiful thing about this one is he says, verse 37, blessed are the ones, blessed will be those servants the master finds alert when he comes. Truly, I tell you, now watch this. He will get ready, meaning the master. He will get ready. Have them, he's talking about the servants, recline at the table, then come and serve them. If he comes in the middle of the night or even near dawn and finds his servants alert, finds them alert, blessed are those servants. He says, the person who is waiting for Christ's return and waiting for him, and he got the door ready open. And this is a Christian. This is someone who's going to be forever with him. And guess what? He's, he's going he's to see you. He's going to set, you sit down here. And you're not going to feel worthy to be sitting down there. But he's going to set you down there and say, I got a meal for you. And I want to serve you. It's called the wedding feast of the Lamb. I mean, that's a, that's a time that we will sit down at his table. And he will provide for the bride. And then, so those three people waiting. Um, service lamps, or service ready, lamps lit, people waiting. Those three are all talking about the first part of that statement. The certain event. Okay, then the last one is about that uncertain time. So in verse 39, it says, but know this, if the homeowner had known at what hour the thief was coming, he wouldn't have let his house be broken into. Now, this, this doesn't relate to the other three verses that are there. This is a separate illustration that he's giving. This is a homeowner who's actually home, who owns the home. He says, if the homeowner had known a thief was coming, he, he wouldn't, he, it wouldn't be, he would be prepared for that happening. But that's not how a thief works. How many have had their home broken into? Ooh, a couple. Yeah. We were at a basketball game when I was at uh, uh, high school. No, it was junior high. We were at a basketball game, and we all went to the basketball game. We were a really small town, and uh, it was a great game, and it, it was a snowy night. Coming home, man, we were thinking of hot cocoa, and, all, you know, it was going to be a great time, and we got to the house, and as soon as Dad pulled in, and the lights shined on the house, he went, uh, you guys don't get out of the car. 
he knew he knew something was something was out of place something was wrong and uh he went up and and here the door was broken into and people had broken into the garage and took chainsaws and guns and all that kind of stuff that they could take, you know, and everything else. Called the cops. They came out. You know, it was snowing. So what happened? The tracks were the tracks were all gone and everything. And um, it was interesting uh, what that did to my father. For the next, oh man, I don't know, six months, he wouldn't go anywhere. He wouldn't go anywhere. He would. We would go, <laughs> and he'd sit at home. And sometimes he'd sit at home with the, all the lights out. And his shotgun in his hand. Yeah, it had an effect on my dad. It really did. But, but the whole point is, you don't know when the thief comes. That's the, whole, that's the whole point. We don't know the day or the hour in which this will happen. Because we don't know, what do we need to be? We need to be ready. We need to be ready. Now, again, who is speaking these words to us? Jesus. But who does Jesus say he is? God. Our greatest evidence, if there's a God, is Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ, as God, is telling us he is coming back again. And therefore, be ready for him. Be ready for him. Wow, I preached a long time there, didn't I? There's a lot of scriptures. So let's, uh, let's stand and we'll sing our final song and um, uh, fitting to sing Revelation song as we think about his return. Heavenly Father, thank you for this, these passages of scripture this morning. Thank you for the opportunity, Lord, to dig deep into this major teaching that you have given. Help us, Lord Jesus, not to bypass that whole point that that there is a God because there is a Jesus, and Jesus said he is God, you are God, and, and our God is telling us that he is returning again, and therefore we need to be ready for his return. We need to live lives that are godly. We need to live lives that honor him. We need to take very seriously, Lord, the, co the commandments and the commission that have been given to us. And so, Lord, even though we know much about the end of times because you have given us much about the end of times. Uh, Lord, may we not lose that fact that the day and the hour we do not know. So we will be ready, Lord. And we'll look forward to that time when, uh, though we are so unworthy, you set us down at a table and you serve us. In your precious name, amen. things we know because God has given these images in the scripture for us to know these. Clothed in rainbows of living color, flashes of lightning, rolls of thunder. Flash 
blessing and honor, strength and glory and power be to you, the only wise King. What do we sing to him? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of kings. You are my everything, and I will.